Are we in? <laughs> 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 Running, yeah. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for turning out for another yours event. I think this is the last but one of the terms. Is that right? One, one, yeah, one more to go next one week. Um, and this week, very pleased to welcome Rose Furby um, from the University of Exeter. And uh, Rose has an interesting background involved in archaeology and archaeological practice, read archaeology and anthropology at Cambridge, then fine art, is that right, at Edinburgh? <coughs> Illustrations at Edinburgh, <laughs> art, close. Um, uh, and now she's, uh, now she's doing a PhD at the University of Exeter in geography with um, uh, Kate De Silvey, who's now who's about to become an external examiner here in cultural heritage management in the department. So there's all sorts of interesting connections that hopefully we can continue to make in the future. Uh, this is um, a talk about uh, the Jurassic Coast, a World Heritage Site, marking time, thinking through stone on the Jurassic Coast. And it is a, um, a, a talk about uh, Rose's PhD research. It's about the landscape, it's about geology, it's about people um, and the interaction of all of those things. So Rose, over Thank to you. you. Should have got the right introduction, John. <laughs> <laughs> Do the lights off or anything? Um, yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. It's really nice to be here again and um, to see so many familiar faces and things. Um, and hopefully, this talk is going to be nice and full of uh, nice pictures and nice bits of film and things. So, for a Tuesday with the lights off, it won't be too much effort, hopefully. Um, so, as John said, I sort of had a, a mixed background, and when I went down to the Jurassic Coast, the first thing that struck me about it was the stone that it was made of, and uh, the very uh, presence of the stone. And by just sort of getting into that material, I've had the chance to uh, see how we can really work through the material itself and go beyond what I've done really in archaeology, in sort of stopping at, at natural, I suppose, when you're digging, and go right down beyond that into the geology. And in doing so, it's been a really nice way of being able to play with narrative. So joining narratives together, not just within the archaeological stuff, but right down into the rock itself, and think about how we tell the stories about the Earth and um, learn about ourselves through those. So this talk is really going to be about the sort of the heritage of knowledge, the heritage of material, um, and how we value uh, the world around us and how we can sort of grow to see it in new ways, I suppose. So first of all, let's give you a little bit about my background and things. Um, as archaeologists, we all know that we have that kind of very uh, unique experience of the landscape. Um, we get to actually dig into it. We get to know it in that sort of very nuanced way. I don't know if you're looking at that and just thinking, I just want to just take that bit of grit down and just, oh, just take that, find the natural, do this. Yeah. And you have that, that feeling about the earth, don't you? You know what it's like to be in it. And you know what it's like to sort of to be able to read those differences in soil. And it's something which, um, I think it's probably why a lot of us do it, and um, it's something that you uh, always value as an archaeologist, I think, it's just that very um, uh, immediate contact that you have with the earth, and then you get to know it in a way, so you can remember a section that you dug 10 years ago, but you can't remember what you did last week. And we have sort of all the ways that, um, of interpreting that, and we've developed all ways of uh, communicating it. And during the time that I was doing illustration, I became very interested in how we can communicate those ideas of what archaeology is really all about and those feelings that we were just talking about. Um, and this was a screen print I did when I was uh, up in Edinburgh. Um, and it's all about how we can break down images of things like aerial photographs into those layers. We all know how to read aerial photographs and read geophysics, um, read um, all sorts of maps. But if we break it down and peel it away and then start laying it back on the paper, there's something about putting it back in those layers that makes us think about how we take it away in the earth. And getting the chance to do drawing and things like this is just a way of looking at things in that little bit more detail. So really, um, part of what this talk is about, as you'll see, is it's quite um, image heavy. And a lot of my work is about how you can learn about the world around you by taking images, by making images. Um, and my journey sort of <coughs> into stone began, well, far back, but um, a few years ago, Mark Edmonds and I uh, worked on stone work, which is about um, Neolithic quarries in Cumbria, which Mark has obviously been doing for years. 
And we were trying to find another way of narrating the, uh, the process of uh, the people would have gone through uh, going up to these quarries and making things like these, which are the Belmont axes, which Mark had in his office for a while, if any of you got the pleasure of seeing them, they're very nice. And we were, sorry, we were experimenting with um, how you could uh, tell stories about stone in different ways. <laughs> and then I started down on the Jurassic Coast. So here we are, down south. I haven't quite got map of England, but I'm all presuming you know vaguely where this is. We've got Exeter over there. Here we've got Bournemouth, Southampton's off that way, Bristol's up there. But the Isle of Portland's poking off. Um, and in 2002, this was designated um, the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site. But it's been known for a long time because of its value um, as a geological area. And right back, you know, with the beginnings of geology, this was where people were sort of thinking about, um, you know, how the earth uh, was made and formed. And you've got people like Buckland and Belabesh um, saying, a few parts of the world present in a small compass are instructive a series of geological phenomena as those which are displayed in the vertical cliffs of the south coast of England. It was made a World Heritage Site on um, three main points. The first being that it had near continuous sequence of Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous rocks. So in the uh, west, down at the extra end, it starts off in the Triassic, and then as you move along, you come through the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, where you sort of have old Harry's rocks and Swanage. Um, and it's one of the few places where that's happened because everything's basically tilted up and then cut away. So you're actually seeing a, a journey in time as you journey along the coast from west to east. Um, it's got internationally important Mesozoic fossil landscape and textbook geomorphological features for any of you who grew up around there and had to go on geological <laughs> field trips. <laughs> um, and really my work sort of after exploring the coast quite a lot it began to concentrate on three main areas or four except Portland isn't on here sorry Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got Beer and Branska which are the top and then Lime Regis and Charm in the middle and then at the eastern end, we've got uh, Swanage and Swanage Bay with old Harry's Rocks just there, and you can see Bournemouth off in the distance. So the talk really today is going to concentrate on the on Lyme Regis and the Purbeck area. So, stone. Here we are on the beach, holding up a nice bit of weathered marble. And um, the great thing about stone is, I think Alan Garner said it the best, the stone book had in it all the stories of the world. Stone has this remarkable ability that you, you're able to look back for millions and millions of years, right to how things were forming, but join in with that, all the stories of sort of how people started to explore it, what people have made from it, how people relate to it, how people know it. And one of my quarrymen said to me recently that um, knowing it really brings it alive. And really that's what this talk is about, is a way of knowing stone in a different way that brings it alive and that you can retell. Um, and Jaquetta Hawkes in the land talks about how geologists and archaeologists, um, their job is to sort of reawaken the memory of the, the world. Um, and that's really what this talk is about, sort of reawakening and pulling out some of these stories. And going into this landscape, it was sort of all a bit overwhelming at first. There's lots of things that you could do to, to do with stone. There's lots of artists working, all sorts of bits and bobs. But straight away almost, my interest became quite uh, focused on two areas, and that was the work of geologists and the work of quarrymen, and how those two quite different um, kind of jobs, in a way, um, actually produce kind of different sorts of knowledge, but also uh, bring lots of ideas together in very nice ways, and used together can actually give us a very interesting perspective on the landscape. So this is just the rough outline of how the talk's going to go. We'll get straight into it. So we're going to start off with some geology. We'll start at the, at the base. And I'm going to take you to Lyme Regis. So here we are, Lyme Regis up there. It's still it's on the Devon Dorset border. And um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. You might know it um, from stories about Mary Anning, uh, things like persuasion, all those sorts of things, the cob. Um, and I remember before I went there, it was the stories of Mary Anning that really brought it alive for me. And here we've got an ichthyosaur in the Natural History Museum. Um, you know, that beginnings of geology, people starting to piece together these strange creatures coming out of the ground. 
But the person who's had the most influence on my reading of Lyme readers and my sort of experience of it um, is Richard Edmonds, who's the Earth Science Manager on the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site team. Um, and here he was on January day with a cold, looking for fossils. We didn't find any, we got cold. Um, but um, I want to sort of start drawing out some of those ideas about geology through one story about Richard and his ichthyosaur. So a couple of years ago in January, Richard sent me this picture by email and just said, do you want to come and dig it? And I thought, yeah. <laughs> and it was the vertebral column of an ichthyosaur just caught there. And he picked this block up on Christmas Day while he'd been out on the beach. And um, he realised that it obviously just popped out of the, um, the ledges on the beach and there must be a lot more of it to be found. So he hunted for three days and then he found this little hole where it had come from. So we all went down to the beach in January and had a look at it. And um, this was waiting for the tide to go out. So I was quite intrigued as to what a fossil excavation would be like in comparison with archaeological excavation. And on the beach, it's certainly an idea of uh, quick. That would do. <laughs> and on the ledges here, you have to sort of watch the tide coming in at funny, you know, wrapping around you. And luckily, Richard's in the Coast Guard, so I felt in good hands. But um, so work commenced with the shovel. And unlike how we would do it, taking things very carefully from the top, um, Richard um, and you've got Chris Moore, who's a professional fossil collector and preparator, and his son was there as well, and another guy. And they can sort of judge where everything is in the stratigraphy. So it's just a matter, really, of pulling it off, and there you have it. You start to see the vertebrae and the ribs of the ichthyosaur. And um, I found it quite difficult to work out what was actual bone or fossil and what was the impression of fossil. And it was suddenly quite a foreign environment really, trying to read all these different things. And amidst all the mud and people squidging around, trying to pick out things and work out how you're meant to record it. You are meant to record it. You just sort of put it all back together later. I discovered. And so we started getting all sorts of really nice bits out. And then we took it off the beach in pieces on a stretcher, like a war wound, wounded veteran. And then, um, it ended up in Richard's garage, and here it is, the first bits sort of being assembled, which is starting to work out where they go. And then Richard spent a very long time cutting off the back to bring it to the same level, cutting out all the piddocks, which are these horrible little uh, burrowing creatures that if they die, they smell really bad. So he had to take out about 300 of those. Um, and I know a bit later in the year, it was much more whole, you can see it's starting to become a bit more you starting to stick bits together. Um, there were still a few odd bits lying around. But it was pretty much there. And so by about a year ago, he got it all into one piece. And he was able to um, reconstruct what happened to the ichthyosaur 195 million years ago. And this ichthyosaur had um, died and floated to the bottom of quite a shallow ocean. And then it filled with gas. And because there wasn't enough pressure to hold it down, it floated back up to the top, uh, to the top again. And something had taken a bite out of its back end, which had weighed down the front of it, so it kind of nosedived back into the, to the sand at the bottom. So this is actually its head end up here, and these long bits here, you can see the bits of its jaw that are scattered around as it sort of comes in. And then up here we've got the tail end. And it would have been about three or four metres long originally, I think. Um, and Richard could even see sort of where um, ripples and uh, currents had worked through it and pushed fossils bits of bone together so he could reconstruct in quite a lot of detail what happened over that huge time frame and when I started thinking about this carefully it kind of struck me that um, this was no longer a story about the ichthyosaur this was very much a story about Richard and his ichthyosaur and it was this sort of connection between one person and a creature that went extinct millions and millions of years ago we haven't even begun to be evolved at that point and yet they sort of come back together in a narrative that will now continue. And within that narrative are also the photographs that I took, the video that I made, the other people who were on the beach and who came and visited. And it sort of gathered these stories within it. Um, and it just struck me as a very nice way of sort of seeing things which can sometimes seem a bit difficult to comprehend and very much in the distant past. Now I want to go on to looking at how we, um, the relationship between quarrymen and geologists develops. We're going to move up the coast into Purbeck, so up that far end, and again, we've got all kinds of rocks and Bournemouth. 
Purbeck's an area which basically really goes up beyond that box and out a little bit to the left. Um, and it's defined by um, a group of hills where it's cut off, so it becomes, it's called the Isle of Purbeck. And it's quite a unique area, really. Um, we're just going to concentrate on this one bit at the end near Swanage, in St Alden's Head, which is this big protruding line here. And um, when I first got down here and started looking in the quarries and exploring the geology, I didn't understand the thing. It was the most complicated thing I've ever had to comprehend. And uh, I'd look at maps, I'd talk to people, I'd go out and look at things, and I still can, and it's taken me years to get a handle on it, really. And although it looks very simple in here, there's actually about 80 different beds of Purbeck stone. So it's not like stone where you can just quarry it out in one big chunk out the ground. It's, in, it's almost like an archaeological stratigraphy, really. Um, and the dark blue line there is the upper Purbeck beds, which is the marble beds, so where we get Purbeck marble, which you might have seen in places like Salisbury Cathedral. And I think there's a tomb um, in the minster here made out of it as well. Um, and the geology here is made more complex, not just by the fact that it's made up of all these different beds that were formed in sort of swampy conditions and then marine, little tiny bit marine conditions and back to swamp, but also by the fact that everything's been folded and sort of scooped in the um, preceding years. And this is the Longworth crumple. You can see how the rock's been pushed almost vertical. And um, Richard described this to me as, um, if you imagine the Alps being formed as a pebble being dropped in a pond, and um, this is like the final little ripple on the end edge of that. Um, so it's just happening then, and it pushes everything into a strange stratigraphy. So things sort of emerge out of the ground where you wouldn't expect them, and what you think is up is down, and all sorts of odd things like that. And you can see it again here, happening on different ways. And it's all very well seen out on the coast. That's kind of quite easy to comprehend. But once you move inland, unless you have a view under the ground, you can't really begin to understand that geology. So it's in the quarries in Perbeck that you really get a view, a keyhole view into different aspects of the stratigraphy. And this is just actually quite a shallow bit in a new quarry, um, just showing how they're dipping away. But some of them really do sort of maintain that very sharp dip. And we have all the different sorts of beds. So as I said, there's I think up to 80, there may be even more. And um, there are ones that come out days where I've never heard of it before, and then people talk about it. So you feel like you're never ever going to know the names of all these different beds. Um, and here we have green marble, top, blue marble, grub, thornback, spangle, grub again. But you have all sorts of ones that the quarrymen have named, it's sort of in parts with the properties they have, um, and where they're found, how they're dug out, what they're used for. Um, and this sort of creates. Um, a slightly problematic situation in that the geologists also have all their names for the beds and they have a different way of grouping it so they group it according to how things are formed according to what fossils you find so actually trying to work between the two fields is incredibly difficult because you've got quarrymen telling you that something's white bed and then river bed and that comes below this this and that and then you've got a geologist saying well when you find the uh thing this is here and here and here but then that's what it took so it's quite difficult to bring it all together Um, and here we have, back in the day, in 1857, uh, Beckles digging his mammal pit in Durlston, which is down her back. And he was using um, quarrymen to basically dig out the pit for him because they knew the beds very well um, and they could obviously do the, the manual work. Um, but what I found interesting from looking at sort of uh, people like Delabesh and Buckland and those early geologists is just how much they actually refer to the quarrymen in terms of the quarrymen said that this bed comes under that one, or the quarrymen say that this thing is found here but not there. So there obviously there's a lot of communication going on between them. But interestingly, it's the geologists' records that get kept because they write them down, they see develop maps, all sorts. So we have quite a detailed record from them. But the quarrymen, especially in Purbeck, guarded their knowledge incredibly carefully. So the Purbeck <coughs> Marblers um, is a, well, still a guild, but basically in the, um, the 19th century you only were allowed to work in a quarry if your father had worked in it and there were all sorts of rules and no one ever wrote anything down, no one drew maps, everything was in your head and you passed it on to the next person who you were training up. Um, so there's a whole area of knowledge which is basically just held, still held in people's heads in Perbeck 
And now, obviously, there's a lot more sharing. People are very interested in telling people about um, the quarries. But very little is still written down. So there's a very interesting thing, not just in the language that's used and the way of thinking, but also in the knowledge that's kept and how it's communicated. Um, and what's interesting there now is that this sort of relationship between geologists and quarrymen is growing closer as obviously there's lots of intelligent people working around. Um, and one of um, the quarries, uh, they were digging away and stopped on this layer, which is the lower free zone. And uh, another quarryman walked along and recognised these, you can see, sort of small puddle like, features. And he recognised them as uh, dinosaur footprints. So they stopped quarrying and cleaned it off. And this is now the longest known trackway of dinosaur footprints in the UK. Um, and it's made by a um, sauropod of some kind, perhaps a diplodocus or dicodocus or however you meant to say it now. Um, and you can just see how it's, well, there's been a number of different creatures and they've just squelched through the mud. And in some of them you actually find the footprints of smaller animals that have walked through the footprint of the adults. And there's things like a tail scrape. So you can really imagine this sort of scene in this swamp um, about 130 million years ago. And then one of the quarrymen has been helping um, with a project to record these with 3D. So I don't know if any of you have recognised Dominic Powers in there, came down to help. And um, we recorded all the footprints um, with 3D photography. And Mark, who was in the previous photo, Mark's father Trev, is um, a very good example of how now um, these two worlds of geology and quarry are really coming together in certain individuals and creating um, very important archives of knowledge. And Trev um, is, I think he's about 10th generation quarryman in Purbeck now. Um, he's very interested uh, in history, he's done um, far more research than I could ever do. He's got a lifetime of knowledge behind him. He's the known person to go to if you want to know anything. And in his museum, that he's made, he's got a very interesting mix of both fossil species and then records of um, uh, quarrying tools, medieval masonry examples. Here we've got um, uh, 13th century marble tombs that were being made um, that they found outside marble quarries where they had broken into old quarries and found these just left as they had been in the 13th century. So just obviously something had happened, they got left and um, now he's keeping it, and he can tell you all sorts of things about the tool marks on them, and then take you to another part of the museum and show you uh, different sorts of tools. So his knowledge is this amazing sort of mixture of the geological um, and the quarry. Um, and it's this knowledge that's um, created through digging that I now want to go into a little bit deeper. So on the coast of Purbeck, if any of you have ever been there, the thing which is sort of, um, it's made famous for always the old cliff quarries. Um, you've got places like Seacombe here and Winspit where they were digging into the cliffs and in through underground passages to take out certain beds of stone. And down in the valley towards um, Harmon's Cross, you've got this set of woodland which runs along that dark blue line of the marble belt, which I showed you on the geological map before. And in there, apart from wild garlic, <laughs> um, there's the sort of rise and fall of the old um, quarry workings. Um, and this was all medieval workings. And in Dunshay Manor, which is just along from here, there's a big, big pit at the back where they're digging marble. And that pit is basically all the marble that is now in Salisbury Cathedral. So in that one pit that was dug in the 12th century, it's all going over to Salisbury. So where there's a negative in the landscape here, there's a positive over in Salisbury. But it's very easy to see these parts as what we might think of as heritage. They're old, they can tell us a lot about the past. Um, but what I've become very interested in is how it's this process of uh, quarrying now that's actually a very valuable um, heritage aspect which shouldn't be undervalued and is in danger of sort of um, being lost, really. Um, so it's holes like this. In Purbeck, we don't have huge, I don't know if any of you have done commercial archaeology, but I know Elizabeth who works in quarries, you end up in the big sort of um, gravel quarries and they're horrendous. Um, or you know, if you look at some of the limestone quarries like Coldstone up in the Dales, these huge craters 
In Purbeck, they're really just little tiny holes like this, and they can dig a little bit, and then they fill it back in, and we move, move over to the side and dig the next bit. Um, so I just want to show you. Just to come up here. Oh, did I? Yeah. Oh. It's not going to do it, is it? Sorry. That's right. You'll have to imagine that you've seen it. <laughs> um, so that was really a, t a time lapse looking at the digging out of this hole. And um, this was in May a couple of years ago that I went and I thought I'd do a nice time lapse to show. Um, digging going on in the quarry and I sat up there with my camera so it wouldn't get um, taken out by JCB or anything and in the process of sitting there I realised that um, really this was just like archaeology on a grand scale and this sort of landscape you have to take it down layer by layer and so they're very carefully scraping off they do just what we do they clean off each bed and then dig it and then clean the next one um, and in the process of doing that the landscape is changing around the clouds are coming over the seasons are changing and it's a sort of very nice um, way of seeing into the landscape, which I was actually quite surprised about. Um, and then an opportunity came up um, with the same quarry. They were going to start digging a new, a new site. So here is Broadmead um, in its untouched, nice sheep grazed field. And um, we did time lapse on it from the very beginning when it, the first bit of turf came off. Um, and so I was able to go back every few weeks and then um, and look at what was going on. And the stone in Purbeck is so complex that unless you've seen it being dug, it's sometimes quite difficult to understand it. And as I saw this quarry going down over the summer, it kind of gave me a really new understanding of how these things um, work. So here in this picture, we've got the rags coming up. And these are often used for things like walling and crazy paving and things. You see them quite a lot. But it was the first time I'd ever seen them being dug. We went through a lot of layers of rag, and what I was straight away surprised about was how unpredictable the ground was. So I went back the next time, and everything was just dipping away, and they were quite surprised about it as well. So this next, the next few beds are going right down there, and they've been left in the shelf up into the corner. And then as time went on, it started dipping even more, and the beds that were coming out, you know, were so changeable. You've got these sort of really kind of horrible clay blue ones, really sticky, and then you come down onto this beautiful stone that just peeled off. Um, and in the end, it got, this was by, I think this is now September, really, and we started in May of last year. And so this is the state that was left um, for the winter, covered up so that it wouldn't um, get damaged. And in the process of digging, this layer here, we came across an old underground so one of the undergrounds that had been dug at some point in the past, when it was done, the machinery wasn't there to go from the top. So you made a little shaft down and went through. And so we broke into one of those and they went off exploring up, up those. I just haven't been on this. <laughs> I won't try the time lapse of it. Um, and what also struck me was that it wasn't just the hole that was important. It wasn't just the hole and the stone that I became interested in and attached to. It was um, my awareness that it wasn't just the knowledge of the stone that increased, but the whole landscape around that, that hole. So this is a quarry that was open just next to it, so Broadmead is just through there. And this is turnpike next to it. And in the process of digging uh, Broadmead, anything that wasn't usable stone was put um, in to fill up turnpike to restore it back. And all sorts of little details came out and came to learn about different sorts of stone. All sorts of fossils came out, got some fossilised wood. Sorry to interrupt, just can I? Because so you went off the, um, off the PowerPoint, it's gone off the, uh, the live stream. Just a short interlude, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 
Right, so we just have to get to the side. Well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's right, sorry, Thanks, guys. Guys. Enjoy it all again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was um, also the, a change in ecology around the whole and how much interest all the quarrymen had in um, things like bird life, you know, changing seasons. There was a real kind of awareness of the whole of the landscape around. And for me, it was really nice to see just what that one landscape changing throughout the year. It was very sort of ground, it made you able to think of the process and time. And um, it struck me that these quarries have quite a, a longevity, which I think in academia we're not used to working in. So we work on projects for kind of short amounts of time or a bit longer. But this quarry is going to be open for the next 30 years. Um, so I, yeah, works in hole there. But anyway, when they built it, they boshed through a um, dry stone wall to put the track through. So they put in new gate posts, which meant that we had to build up the um, dry stone wall at either side. So whilst I was there, I built that side, the not very good looking side, and Mark built that side. And it just felt very nice that it was um, suddenly not just about um, an industry in the landscape. It was really quite a personal thing, and people have a kind of an attention to detail, and you feel like you've um, become more deeply part of it because of having that um, sort of very geological rooting in it. Um, and the next sort of stage of this was going underground properly rather than just in the open cast quarries. So, as I said before, in Purbeck, um, you do find quite a lot of underground quarries. They um, quite often break into them when they're quarrying new ones. And under Swanage, you've got a lot of underground quarries which are kind of under buildings and cause lots of problems when they start to subside. And this is one that um, the Hazelands um knocked into a few years ago and they built a new shaft down into it so you can go down but normally it's it's covered up and this is what's down there and um i've read a book by um a quarryman called eric benfield which is probably the only book you can really find about quarrying in purbeck on the shelves or on amazon and um he talks about um quarrying underground and he said that it was a sort of blackness and a, a quiet, unlike anything you've ever imagined. And um, when I first came down to this one, I came with Mark and he had his phone torch on and we sort of went down that big steep staircase and then all I could really see was sort of his legs. So I knew where to step. We went through here and just around the back and it was very disorienting and it's entirely quiet and it's the blackest black you've ever come across. At one point he turned his torch off and I thought I'd died. And uh, it's a very strange atmosphere indeed. Um, and then to take these photographs, I had to have um, use a seven minute exposure. So I just had to sit on a rock with my finger on the bottom, wishing I had a remote control <laughs> um, for seven minutes in the dark with uh, just a few little tiny candles lit. And in that darkness, you sort of see these amazing, um, uh, I don't know, it's just that lovely intersection between human and geological and somehow being there deep in this sort of strange sandwich filling in the middle of the earth, you feel that more than ever. And there was this graffiti from the quarry that was burnt onto the ceiling with lighters. And then in the um, stratigraphy, you can see there's a, there's a thorn back Wexen bed. And then this is the underpicking cap, which is soft, so they take that out to loosen the upper rock. And then the freestone, which is regular for carving. And then what they were doing was, once they'd taken it out, they were using spare bits of stone to keep up the ceiling or to fill in other areas of the, um, of the quarry. And um, when I was going with, along with Mark, we went down this corridor and then we went around the corner and there were all sorts of kind of odd objects around and things. And then right at the end, he just turned his torch up to the ceiling. And there on the ceiling were three dinosaur footprints just walking away in the roach and so they just disappeared off into the distance and it was that magical moment of uh, something so imprinted such a long time ago I think 130 million years ago and then this amazing space built by these people sort of 100 years ago with these odd remnants of, of people um, and it was just very interesting to think about how memory stays in these places and how we value 
the sort of emptiness and the negative spaces in the landscape as much as we do what's built. Because really, these are like a building. In, even though they were taking out stone, they've created this um, very, very unusual space. So just briefly, we're going to move away from Purbeck up to Portland, where there's another space of a similar kind, but of a sort of contrasting nature. And this is an Albion stone quarry. And uh, this is the first quarry to mine underground for about 100 years. Um, and the mine managers worked out exactly how to um, use all the new machinery to go through. And I think they've been doing similar methods in Bath. Um, and it's all developed in Italy, and the big quarries there. I don't know if you can hear it. So they use these amazing um, chainsaws which can cut blocks out and then they use um, what's called a hydro bag which is a sort of reinforced steel pillow and they slot that in around the edges and then slowly just fill it with water and it just sort of literally just pulls the block away in a perfect nice block. There we are, it's going away. And what you get is a space like that, which um, is very different to the one we saw in Perbeck, obviously. Um, but again, it has this amazing sense of being like a building rather than um, uh, a sort of industrial space. And uh, Batinsky, uh, Edward Batinsky, who's a photographer of lots of industrial spaces, he talks about quarries as being like an inverted architecture. And um, this is something that kind of really needs to be valued because just like you get graffiti and all sorts of the old mines, this is a different sort of graffiti with the instructions as to where to cut, where all sorts of different things to do with the running of the mine are etched onto the walls. And there's even things like in some of the sections, there's a reef from a storm that was about 140 million years ago, where you can see all the oyster shells have been pushed up on one side. And the uh, mine manager's wife found a turtle shell um, while she was walking up one day, which annoyed him greatly because <laughs> he hadn't found it. Um, and Rachel Whiteread talks about this idea a lot in her sculpture, this idea of sort of capturing the space inside and how memory is caught in the sort of void area. Um, and she's talked about it being like mummified air. And I think that's quite a nice way of thinking about it. So when you're looking at buildings, you're also thinking about these spaces that are left behind and what empty spaces have to offer. Now, I'm doing the time. I just want to quickly talk about um, the process of working stone and how that can give us a very different knowledge, again, of the different kinds of stone. So here we are back, back in Perbeck again. Um, and this is the Hayson's quarry in the yard. And um, around the yard there's stacks of all sorts of different colours, shapes of stone, all sorts of different beds that have come out, differently treated. Some are sawn, some are ready slabbed, some are guillotined, some are chipped off, some are just raw. And they're all standing around and there's a definite order but when you go there with the inexperienced eye you can't tell what anything is it's just a, a mystery um and it really requires them to have a very very close knowledge of not just the different beds but the different nuances within these beds as well in order to process it through into different jobs so here we are now in the masonry shed and I just want to talk quickly about one kind of stone just to show you kind of how varied um the beds can be. So this is Grub, which is one of my favourite of the Perbeck beds. Here it is, nice and polished. And it's sort of made up of these sort of oyster shells. And here's a Grub, one Grub. <laughs> um, and here it is in section, so you can see how it's just the oyster shells squished up. But here it is raw, without being sawn. And you get these things called dog's nests in the middle of it, which um, are just sort of little empty voids. And then, if you dig it down in Swanage, it looks like this. And if you dig it in Langton, which is about a mile up the road, it looks like that. So, and it, each of them has sort of very uh, subtly different properties. So it requires a great deal of knowledge in order to be able to uh, think through this and work out how it's going to be used. And um, that knowledge really is only gained by actually working with it on an everyday basis. Oh, and here's a really nice bit where something tunnels through. You can see that. But while this was on the this, um, swamp floor, sea floor, something buried through, and um, sort of you can see the tunnel where the shells have been upturned. So inside the masonry shed, it's a bit like an organism. Things are sort of going on, everyone's relating to each other. 
And it requires a great deal of concentration, both on the machine and working by hand. And I think it's very easy for people to assume that if people are using machines, they're just sort of a, you know, a, a robot that they don't have to think about what they're doing. Whereas in actual fact, um, it requires just as much skill as working by hand. And you learn very different things about the stone. So talking to the quarrymen, you know, there about working by hand, they're working with the saw. They'll say, oh yeah, when you're working with a down stone, if you're working with a chisel, that sort of pings. And then on the saw, it makes this noise. And then, um, whereas if you're working with this, it thuds. So they start, you start to see this very interesting sort of sensitive approach to the stone. Um, one thing that I did find is that these different ways of working affect how you learn about very different sorts of beds. So, um, pong freestone is a, a sort of freestone so it can work in any direction, which is used very much for doing uh, lettering jobs. And this is um, Mark carving a replacement plaque for the Beminster plaque, which was damaged um, in a landslide in the, the tunnel. Um, and he was recarving this, and I decided to sort of follow the process of him. Um, making the new one and it going back into the tunnel. And um, in the process of trying to photograph him and film him, I realised that there was a whole sort of rhythm to do lettering, which I hadn't ever been aware of. And doing archaeology, we all come across inscriptions and things. And you, I never really thought that much about how they were made. But seeing this, it was an awareness suddenly that um, it was your whole body that was involved in it. So I learned to sort of uh, anticipate where Mark was going to go that's what Letty was doing, his elbows would be swinging around and the whole body was having to react. And then as he was sort of working up a letter, the whole sound changed as well. So I was able to anticipate when he was getting to the end, because it would go... Doo, 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 doo. <laughs> and uh, as he used different chisels, the tone of it changed. So we came to know that pomfrey stone through lots of different ways, both hearing it and watching it and seeing how it was cut. Thank <laughs> you. 
the nice thing about that, I don't know if you can tell, you can almost feel the texture through the sound that it's making, even though you can't necessarily always see what he's doing. So I decided that I wanted to have a go at it as well. <laughs> um, and so I went and worked with Gary Breeze, who um, some of you who are at Southampton might know, who's the artist in residence there for a while. Um, and he's a stone measuring sculptor, and um, I tried doing it at myself. So this is a block of concrete stone from the quarry, which they nicely gave me, looking just like some sort of uh, Neolithic tomb, or you know, it had a very nice shape to it. Um, it felt almost slightly sacrilegious to put anything on the surface of it. Um, and I got to know it in a whole different way, just sort of having that contact with the chisel. There it is. Um, and I also decided I wanted to uh, try and learn how to do masonry, because I felt it was very important that um, it was all very well people telling you about what they did and describing processes and using words that you didn't necessarily understand. Um, but I felt like unless I'd actually done it myself, I wouldn't ever really be able to understand what they were trying to communicate to me and um, I really like making things and I found it utterly frustrating to watch other people making while I couldn't. So um, Abe Schaffer, who's uh, another mason at the quarry, um, said he would teach me how to do it. So this is a block of fir, which is um, a limestone in the upper permit bed, which comes out just above or just below the marble, I can't remember the entry. Um, and it's used for building lots of the buildings down in Purbeck, it's very traditional building material. And um, everyone has spoken to me about how when you first get a block of stone, you, uh, you take it out of twist. And that basically means to sort of, that you find the grain and you set the first flat surface that goes with the grain of the stone. So when you first get it, you have to turn it around, work out which bits of the stone might have possible um, cavities or funny looking bits in it that you might want to avoid. And where the best sort of bit is to start um, what they call boning in, which is taking in corners on a flat plane. Um, and that's the burr, which is the broken limestone. You can see it's made all these tiny little shells that then sort of erode out and you get this beautiful texture to it. But um, beginning to work it, I got to it in a whole new way of pain. <laughs> um, and I absolutely loved it. I discovered that it was actually very like doing archaeology. Um, and there was a certain satisfaction in getting a very nice level and getting uh, everything sort of everything very precise. And as you go along, you have to make sure that you, know, you keep putting your um, straight edge on it, checking everything. Um, and the same as when you're digging, when you're digging away, you can remember that feeling of how different materials feel as you go through them, and you're almost thinking through your hand. It's the same with this, you're just having to let your hand work out where the flat surface is and what's going on. And um, we're using lots of different tools, which I won't go into now because we're running out of time, but you sort of start to create these different surfaces um, that get rougher and then smoother and smoother as you get it down to your finished surface. And then here's an example of how good Abe is in the background and then how rubbish I am in the foreground. <laughs> but you can just, if you watch Abe's body language there, you can see he's almost not even trying, he's just, he's got into his own rhythm. Mine's just a bit like tentative, I think would be a kind word. But um, yeah, doing that, uh, working with Abe in that way, it's just a really nice way of sort of seeing how actually it's bloody difficult things to do. And um, Abe's been doing it for about 10 years now, I think. And he calls it a period of acquaintance. And um, he said that I had a very short period of acquaintance, so it didn't matter. That was a bit of a question. And then finally, I just want to um, sort of go into how these experiences of um, looking at how the stone's coming out of the hole, thinking about the geology, and working with it with your hands can be taken sort of out into the wider landscape, out of the quarry. Um, to start thinking about other buildings and where the stone goes. So looking at the other end of the, uh, the process. And um, living in Exeter, I walked past Exeter Cathedral every day on my way to work, and um, I became very aware that it actually had the stone, it was built of the stone which, uh, from all the quarries which I was working at along the coast. So that huge coastline, it had Purbeck marble, had a tiny bit of Portland in it, and it had beer stone and Branscombe stone, which is a quite another quarry which I haven't included here. Um, so I decided that actually it was a very interesting way of seeing how all these sort of disparate parts of um, differently historically uh, quarried areas could be brought together in one, one building. Here we are, lovely Exeter Cathedral, <coughs> and it's a nice west front. And this is all built out of um, beer and Branscombe stone, although the Victorians have done lots of patching up work with sort of 
other stones from Somerset and things like that. So it's a bit of a patchwork. Um, and then if we go inside, I know, here we are, so the west front. So it's got a very nice beer stone is used for carving all of those figures at the front. Because when beer stone comes out, it's quite soft, so it's very good for carving, but then it hardens up um, a bit like bath stone does as well. So then you get a very hard stone that weathers very well. I think this is 13th century, this front, so considering this, this angel isn't doing too badly. And then this is inside Exeter Cathedral. I don't know if any of you have ever been, but it's got the longest, um, what do you call it? Transept? <laughs> the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with the arches going down. Um, and it is a stunning piece of architecture. And you can see here at the bottom in the, the columns, that's our blue perfect marble there that was taken out from those quarries that we looked at in the woods with all the wild garlic. Um, and when I started going into the cathedral, I, um, I met up with the archaeologist there and a man called Peter Dare, who was an apprentice at the beer quarries and then was the uh, master mason in the cathedral for a number of years as well. And um, we were looking at some of the marble, and they weren't necessarily aware that there were lots of different kinds of, there were three different beds of marble. So this is, we couldn't quite work out if this was grey marble or green, I think it was grey, and then you've got the blue marble there. But I decided that it'd be really nice to get um, the Hastings down, and especially Trev Hastings, who has all that really kind of historical knowledge, to come and have a look and go around with us. So there's Trev, Peter and Mark, we took them around the cathedral and um, they talked about all sorts of things and just opened up a whole other world of possibilities. And the main thing that um, they pointed out was the fact that the entire cathedral floor is made out of different beds of Purbeck stone, which I hadn't noticed um, and no one else has seen that either. Um, so here we are, here's Grub again, our favourite Grub, uh, with his oyster shells in one tomb. And then this is the tomb, um, it's a very impressive tomb, it's about 14 feet long, I think. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that um, this is actually made out of spangle, which is only dug uh, in the cliff quarries of Purbeck. Um, and it's recognisable by these shells here, these Gumeo shells. This is like half, half shells of that, literally. And when I'd seen this stone, it always looks a very pale, um, sort of beige white. Um, with the crystalline shells within it are very blue. And for some reason, in the cathedral environment, it really changed quite a lot. Um, and I think there's only two, maybe three known examples of it being used in um, sort of outside Purbeck, and the other one's Ottery St. Mary, and I think there might be a bit in Westminster. I can't quite remember. Um, but anyway, they were able to spot that, and Trevor was able to talk all about uh, where the stone was from, <coughs> how the lead had been put in later, um, and then the fact that it was a rose on it, and the rose might be linked to this family in Swanage, who were raised to the bishop. And so he was able to make all these connections, which, um, you know, was only because of his very in-depth knowledge of Purbeck. <coughs> and then um, going around with Peter as well, being um, the master mason there for so long, also having that experience in the quarries, he was able to pick up on really kind of interesting different elements and pulled together all sorts of bits of his knowledge. And he was pointing out that on this bit of, um, this is a bit of calm stone, uh, there's quite a lot of calm stone in the cathedral. At one point they stopped using beer and they were shipping it in from France and said, it must have just been a bit cheaper. But um, he was noticing that you start getting this, um, this is made from like clauches, a very fine claw chisel, um, and you don't find that on any of the blocks um, in beer or anything. So he thought that probably that was actually being worked as a block over in Khan and brought over as a work piece of stone specifically for the cathedral. And this is a detail from the Norman Tower um, on the outside. Um, I don't know if you can see on this stone, but these are actually axe marks on a brand thick Branscom stone. So they're using the axe just to carve it away into quite a rough, rough block. So having um, these sort of three people with knowledge of very different stones, but with the kind of combined historical and practical knowledge was just an invaluable source, which um, the cathedral were very grateful for. Um, and it brought out lots of really interesting stories that sort of uh, started wrapping the narratives back over time and space. So um, I'll pretty much at the end now, but really I hope I've managed to make some sense. And this has been about um, 
really kind of appreciating stone as something which you can tell stories with. Um, and that by that we can learn both about the earth and about ourselves in turn. Um, and also learning that these sorts of knowledges are quite delicate. And, um, you know, in Purbeck, the quarries are quite small scale, but they're up against the same sort of planning constrictions as the large aggregates quarries and things like that. Um, and I think it's important to realise the value of the people working there and that knowledge before it dies out and then calling it heritage because it's gone. Um, uh, so it's sort of seeing really what's, what's there and being able to sort of get out some of these stories and retell them and find other interesting ways of telling them and, and getting people interested in it. But um, it's been a fascinating bit of work for me. Just, um, I feel like from having gone from the surface and the archaeology just in that very surface bit, it's opened up like the whole kind of, uh, of the under part, the bit where we normally stop in excavations. And um, I feel like it's given me a very different approach to landscape and one which is uh, much looser and, um, and much more interested in knowing uh, the whole breadth of things rather than maybe just concentrating on, on one small part. Um, so there's all the people I'd like to thank. Obviously this works, I've put it together, but I couldn't do it without the knowledge of all the people who've been very generous um, to me with telling me things again and again <laughs> as I ask more questions. Um, and if you want to find out any more, there's details down there. So thank you very much. <laughs> stories and narratives about a, a landscape. I, I walked along that coast last summer with my son who did the South West Coast Pass. Uh -huh. So that was the bit from last year. So, so a lot of those um, images were very, um, very familiar. Thank you so much for that. Um, we've got time for questions, so uh, please ask those questions or thoughts or colleague. Absolutely brilliant talk. Thank you. It's a, a pleasure to see your research and how it comes together. Um, Saw three major themes kind of going through it, um, two of which I'll comment on the last one I have a question about. The first one was of, of scale, thinking about from going from digger to the masons, from the very um, large scale excavations, the very fine grain, just the, the beautiful work that was going on there. And I would be terrified to actually describe <laughs> anything on those surfaces. But um, and then also thinking about kind of negative architecture, and it just really reminded me of um, Cappadocia, actually and um, the, the churches, Byzantine churches that are in negative there, um, and how they would uh, start working from opposite ends and kind of near the middle, but not quite. But um, I thought it was interesting that she kind of contrasted um, large-scale quarrying and small-scale quarrying. Small-scale quarrying as a heritage object, or um, hopefully not, hopefully it'll be perpetuated, but um, I think that's very different than some of the, the ideas of large art quarrying that I have coming from the States. Um, yeah. Like mountaintop removal, which is the exact yeah. <laughs> horrible <laughs> heritage or anything you want to preserve. And so I was just wondering if you could talk about um, sort of if you thought about the, the negatives of your negative at all. What do you mean, the kind of the unpleasant side of it? Yeah, very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I found it surprising because. As I say, like when I've worked in quarries before, especially as archaeologists, you sort of talk, see, them, see them a little bit negatively as a destructive force. But then, of course, archaeology is destructive as well, and it's about what you learn from it. And really, I suppose it's it maybe scale doesn't make a difference. It's maybe the people involved, because those people could just be they could just not care, but they do, and that makes makes the difference with those quarries. Um, but. Yeah, I think I was surprised because even on Portland, actually, where I saw it as being a little bit more heavily industrial and kind of maybe less involved, a bigger scale and less involved, maybe, I was really surprised and found that actually that wasn't the case at all. And the people there were just as, um, you know, um, involved in the geology. And it was a really massive part of their, their lives and sort of who they've become. And um, they really care about it in all sorts of different ways. So I think actually, I went in thinking it was going to be one way and was very surprised and I think it's given me quite a different view of how we approach landscape in terms of destruction as well and that you can make a good out of out of the bad or what we might see, see as bad. Um, and I remember going to Ham Hill a couple of years ago to see the digging going on there 
uh, where there was the quarry. I basically stood on the edge and down there was the quarry, and up here was the, the level where the archaeologists were desperately trying to finish. And I suddenly felt like I was on this big divide. I didn't quite know which one I felt uh, <laughs> more of an affinity with, but I decided that it was just nice to be able to see a positive out of something going, that things being destroyed doesn't always have to be a bad thing. You actually discover a lot in that process. Um, it's only things like coastal erosion that actually, you know, that's where you find, that's how you find fossils, that's how you learn about what's going on with the coast, and it's just a natural part of what happens. It can cheer you up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have like hundreds of questions, but I'll only ask you one. Um, I thought that, um, I was, I was going to ask, when, when you started doing the carving yourself, did that alter the way that you saw the stone? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, I think you, um, a bit like is it clean, the same, about the sort of seeing the different scales, being able to actually get really deep into it and sort of see it. Literally, you're sort of looking out all the time for a tiny little shell that might send things off a bit skewy or break something, and you're trying to all the time think about how the stone behaves and react to that. And um, yeah, once I'd actually got into it and worked it with my hands, I felt I could understand it in a very different way. A, a muscle memory from doing the... Yeah, I suppose yeah. you do a bit, yeah, and you can kind of imagine, like I was saying with the trowel, you can imagine what it's like to go through different materials, you sort of get that memory of what it's like and the sound of it and then how to react to it in terms of whether it's sort of very hard stone or softer. Um, right. Like the Portland, I didn't show it in here, but I made a sculpture using Portland stone and um, that's very good for carving, but it does occasionally have um, shells in it, which take you by surprise, and then when you get one of those, it can sometimes ping off a big chip. And uh, Gary told me never to get attached to your stone, because otherwise it is the most devastating thing when you chip off a bit that's not meant to be chipped. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a great thing to have been able to get sort of properly into that material. Yeah. Uh, we'll go for Izzy first, then to the back, and we've got Dr. Um, as living beings, do you think there's a way that there's a difference between the way that we connect with, say, sedimentary and metamorphic rocks, which may contain fossils, and igneous? Well, oh, that's an interesting question. See, I was thinking about it as another train on the way here <laughs> because um, I've got a very good friend who's also been doing PhD, weirdly enough, in a quarry down in Cornwall, also in Haven, and he works with granite, and he's actually a, a, a mason. Um, and we quite often have conversations and I wonder, I was thinking on the train, I wonder if it reflects our characters, the fact that I like limestone and he likes granite, but actually I think it's just where we're based. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think there is that, ex certainly I find there's an extra draw to the, um, with the limestones it's not just um, the uh, fossil content, but it's also that ability to work with them and the history of working that's gone on with them as a building stone. Um, but things like the igneous rocks have a different quality and it's not something that particularly attracts me but other people find that sort of rawness and kind of earthy fieriness and kind of i don't know there's something about igneous it's very wild isn't there and um, other people are attracted to that <laughs> so i don't know it's odd that maybe it reflects the great personality what you're, what you're interested in or what you can read find to read in it like david who works in the granite quarry his phd is all about getting under the surface of the granite and really understanding it as a mason and um, finding different processes, dealing with it, and there's a lot in here about getting really numb with granite because it just got to push it, and you know, it's sort of these different ways of understanding that you really think <coughs> that you'd presume was quite in it, you know, innate, and it's just a stone, it actually sort of yeah, it makes these reactions, but yeah, I think it is interesting what we are attracted to. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, fascinating, really, I mean really fascinating. This narrative that you started to explore with the, with the quarry men, and you talked about their, their knowledge gained over you know, generations of working with the stone, this secret knowledge that they passed on for, to each other, and the fact that now they seem to be able to identify with that knowledge. Do you, do you think they have developed an empathy with it now because they can, mm -hmm. and yet the source of the knowledge was actually commercial efficiencies? Do you know what I mean? In, in the early days, they learned how to understand the seams and the strata mm. because they needed to, because it was economically efficient. But now, because you know, mindsets have moved on, they've got the ability to be able to develop this empathy. 
Um, I don't know. I think it's quite. I think Perbeck is quite an unusual case because the technology hasn't been able to move on so far because it's such um, a bugger of a material. Because it's got that sort of really complex layering, it still requires um, a lot of attention. Um, and so I think the knowledge that comes with it. I've been quite interested in historically what quarrymen would have been interested in in terms of was it just practical or did they find fossils and wonder what it was or did they try and understand why it was the way it was but obviously without having that record you can't really you can sort of speculate but you can't really tell very much um whereas now there's there's more i don't think there's more time or people are more interested or there's just a lot more sort of communication between geologists quarrymen you know, Trevor and his quarry has people in now all the time doing different things and, um, you know, chatting about all different elements. Um, but I certainly think, I was thinking about it and thought, actually, this case is quite un perhaps quite unique in some ways because um, that quarry, they're always very interested to talk about it and they've just let me get on with the work and um, they've been very generous with knowledge. And I think maybe other people wouldn't see the point of it or wouldn't quite understand why I was doing it or wouldn't want to share things or wouldn't be interested enough to share things. So it's hard to sort of make a speculation about the whole quarry industry based on just on that. I don't know if that answers your question or if I've wandered off it. Well, just as I mean, in your fascinating example, I mean, because it's this thing that you, know, you, you talk a lot about this real emotion with the, the materials that you're working with. And it's just, you know, I know back to these um, times when it was a much harder task and therefore they'd have to be very efficient. Yeah. I understand it. Yeah. But now, perhaps because of mechanisation, perhaps because of developing attitudes, they have the time to be able to appreciate and develop this, this empathy with, with this. With yeah, this. that's true. I think there's probably always a degree of sensitivity, but like you say, I don't think it was ever a romantic thing. Um, like those cliff quarries now are seen as being very romantic and, oh, you know, quarrying in the past. And actually, it must have been horrible. And um, some of the quarries, like the downstream quarries, are about 20 feet below the ground and they had a shaft going down and then they have to walk on their knuckles and sort of basically on their bottom shuffle along and just be down there just with a candle by themselves bringing out stone. You just think that must have been horrible. And um, yeah, I thought about going down on those, those tunnels and I just, the thought made me feel a bit funny. I don't mind going underground, but I don't want to go in a, in a straw. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it's kind of an interesting thing that I think it's quite easy to romanticise. Or even this stuff, I've, I hope it's not romanticising it, because it is bloody hard work still, and it's, um, you know, especially in the winter when they're there, you know, 10 hours a day in all the wet, it's just sometimes not very pleasant. But um, I think it's that interesting thing about the records not being available for people in the past. So I would be very interested to see what they, whether it was just based on individuals as to whether they yeah, question what fossils were and things. And um, Trevor was saying his father used to tell him that um, when people found fossils, um, they sometimes found like the fossil fish and things. And they, you know, the, the men of his grandfather's time just sort of said, no, it must have just been Noah's flood. And, um, and that was, you know, quite recently, I suppose. It was at the end of the 19th century, something like that. But um, yeah, it's an <coughs> interesting one. Uh, it's a lovely, fascinating exploration of human human experience and materiality, and how you get to grips with that. But the, the geologists and quarrymen have have a very particular relationship with that material. I just wonder if there's a next step because because what they produce gets into that landscape, and the local landscape. I'm not that that, that landscape is a stunning, beautiful old leaf. But behind you, as you look out to the ocean, the old fields and the buildings and the farms are made of that stone. Mm. Do you wish to give that texture to the landscape? Yeah. Now, just talk about local people's reactions to the rock and the stone that form part of their landscape. Once it's come out of those quarries, is there another piece of like exploring that relationship? That yeah. Materiality? Well, it's very interesting. I talked to, um, there's another geologist who works for the Jurassic Coast team called Sam Scriven, and he's been doing a lot of work to do with this as to how. Um, how we relate to landscape in terms of, like, I realise that I like Perbeck a lot because it kind of reminds me of the Dales and yeah. being from around here, there's certain elements of it, the limestone, the way the walls are built, little things that are the way the land is shaped because that's mm. where I've grown up. And you know, he said he grew up at certain points and it has 
he finds these connections. Mm. But then sometimes you talk to people in Swanage and you say, like, oh yeah, that's a nice bit of stone, isn't it? And they go, oh, whatever. Yeah, stone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't even realise there's a quarry up the road. Yeah. Or, um, but it's, yeah, I think it is quite interesting to see how people react to it. But a lot of people, I think it's just the, it's just the background, isn't it? And, um, and certainly for me, it probably was. I mean, maybe I looked at it slightly more carefully in an archaeological perspective. But it wasn't until I started really doing this work that it opened up. Now I sort of go around looking at all sorts of things on buildings that I never looked at before. Or, um, yeah. Pretty much at the time of any draw close. <laughs> Is there any burning final questions before we get off? Steve, yes. I just comment on the question, really. Uh, Straight to me that you know, you're saying the geologists kind of draw together, but it does seem sort of fundamental difference for me, quarrying and the archaeologists and other people are just glorifying treasure hunters really, because they're interested in the object but not particularly understanding the context. And, and and people who are kind of working with the strata <coughs> necessarily have to understand them are the quarrying that that side of things. And do, you, do you think there is a real difference between their objectives? No, I, I think I'd, the I'd argue with a bit there, in that geologists are, well, the stratigraphy is obviously key to what they're doing as well. It only could, I only showed the fossil example of the geological stuff, but obviously that's very much what they're thinking about is the stratigraphy. And this is where it comes together, it's in this reading of stratigraphy inland, is the quarries are going in, and then geologists are able to come and look and explore within that as well. I mean, there's obvious differences in terms of how they interpret it, but um, I think there is a very interesting conversation going on there and a way of working together, which goes on a lot, um, sort of unseen, um, in the background to what geologists are finding and what quarrymen are doing. But um, there are differences in approach and for, um, for use and what people are doing it for, but I certainly think there's a very um, important sort of combination in how they're coming together. I don't know if that's what you're getting at, or sort of. Although I still think you know, there's a difference between uh, trying to understand strata and also try and set out where the best preserved whatever set of bones might be. That's an object, isn't it? That's the object of your inquiry. But that's not necessarily that... what they're doing, though. They're looking at because they're trying to work out how things are formed. So geologists are looking at the whole strata in terms of how it's relating to other parts of the world. How it's looking at you yeah, know, the that hunt for fossils. <laughs> Uh, maybe I should have given another geological example. Maybe I, <laughs> I penned them in. A lot of that goes I mean, on that bit of beat my mind. It's just those are yeah. and what they're doing is finding objects. Yeah. I think the thing is, is the fossils get the attention, whereas there's a lot of work going on with the sort of more um, teeny tiny, um, <laughs> you know, kind of uh, complicated, yeah, nuanced stuff of the strata. Okay, Rose, thank you so much for thought-provoking, beautiful presentation. <laughs> <laughs>